So RJ is a company where we create products and services for a lot of our clients. Um, Google, uh, we work across with Dyson as well, and, and Nike is one of our big players. And essentially, what we do is look at how we connect kind of real customer experience and services with the product um, and what they're basically interested in. So we move that all the way from digital to physical space, and one of our kind of offerings at the moment is looking at the physical environment um, and how do we create that connection between the physical and, and the digital experiences as well. I think one thing that, especially when we're talking about retail and, and the future of what that is, um, I think we're going to know a lot less about our customer than we really think we, we are. So everyone's collecting data and information, but we're going to move very quickly into a world where we think we know a lot, but we don't know anything. And thinking about the example of you go through Google, you start to go into incognito mode, suddenly there's this big disruption between what we know about people what we can serve people, and, and actually how we need to look at creating services that really help you understand them and want people to give information. Um, for me, that's where retail is going into much more of a service-led space versus a traditional just buying products and services and, and getting them as well. OK, so with all the talk about data, we're actually going to have to work harder to get to know the consumer. We're going to have your... to create a proper value exchange, exactly. Okay. So. If you're a consumer, why am I giving you that information? What's the value I get right. back from it? And that's where that shift is going. And when we're going to move to brands and Amazon already starting to do it. And we're going to move to a place where we need to think about what's the service aspect? What's that value exchange? What's something that is useful and interesting that I can actually feel like, all right, I really want to give you my information. I'm getting an exciting experience out of it. That, for me, is what needs mm -hmm. to shift in, in how retail is moving. Okay. That's a good one. Thorsten. Yeah, my name is Thorsten Alas. I'm uh, running the Otto Group Media. My origin is media. When uh, 1997, the first Otto uh, website was published with one million products online, 1997, I was working for Axel Springer as a trainee and was surprised what's going on there. And now, now I really believe in a strong trend. The trend, what is visible is uh, media becomes retail. That the big retailers with their tons of data and with their tons of reach, they now become media houses by using their competencies. And this is why I'm with Otto. And I often, I often hear the question, hey, guys, what, what, what do you do against Amazon? A very oh, we're already getting into that. Okay. <laughs> so, so and, and, and I'm lucky to answer this question later on. OK, good. That's a nice cliffhanger. Uh, OK, Jörn. Yeah, uh, my name is Jan Jogande. I'm uh, running the product division, uh, mobile products for Wirecard. Wirecard is a global payment company. Um, we are supporting Apple. We're working for Microsoft and Sky. We are um, running mobile wallets in the US and uh, Asia Pacific uh, and in Europe, Orange uh, in France and uh, uh, Spain. We are supporting Alipay and WeChat Pay in their initiatives in Europe and Southeast Asia. Um, we think a lot about the retailer because the retailer is for a payment company that is really the core of, uh, uh, of our client base. Um, and we're trying to set up um, uh, services based on the payment transaction that really can help to uh, um, create more conversion in stores for retailers because this is what they are interested in and this is what we actually do. Okay. Yeah. But what's the thing that you believe about the future of retail? I think, I think um, in the next five years, we will see a massive disruption in what I call functional shopping, like supermarkets, grocery stores, these kind of things, you know. When I go shopping on the weekend, my wife is always saying, bring the same stuff like, uh, like every weekend. So Amazon Prime Now, delivery services, supermarkets that come into your house, something like this will totally change the landscape yeah. uh, in, in this area. On the other hand, when, it's, when shopping is fun, when it's really an excitement, when you want to touch things, you know, um, these kind of shopping will, will, will definitely stay, but everything that is functional will, I right. think, pass by. I, uh, Trevor Edwards, the uh, president of brand at Nike yesterday on their earnings call said mediocre retail will not survive. He didn't give a time frame. Thor <laughs> uh, said, I hope that you're not mediocre retail because I want you to survive. Give me the case that, uh, that auto overall is Amazon proofed. Yeah, as I mentioned, we are, we are now for, for, from 1997, just two years after Amazon was founded, in a competition with Amazon. 
And uh, I'm proud that the Otto Group answered with a very clear strategy towards this. I mean, the business case of, of the Otto Group is based on four pillars. First of all, we started from 1997 to transform our original catalog business to digital. And this worked out pretty well. I, my, uh, my CEO, Alexander Birken, just gave an interview in the Wirtschaftspresse that we increase our revenues in digital for 10% in the first half of this year. So we, we expect a growth in, in digital e-commerce about 700 million this year. Secondly, but this is most people look to, to, to the retail, but the auto group is based on three other pillars as well. So we call it create. So we, we found new businesses, built new businesses, what we did with About You, and we're very proud about the growth rate uh, About You as a, as a fashion retailer is running. St uh, pillar number three is we call it venture. So we, we run lots of venture activities in the US with E ventures with platform A. And the fourth pillar of our business is, uh, is participate. And this actually is one of our most successful business parts from, from our entire e-commerce business. We are able, we started first of all to found Hermes, which is a logistic company. Then we started to found EOS, which is a payment and loan company. And finally, of course, now we are entering with the auto group media into the media business. And these four pillars really worked out that we are in a, in a fantastic growth path for, for now about two years mm -hmm. in the auto group. So is the bet that, that Amazon is just not going to figure out furniture and uh, fashion in particular that you're strong in? I mean, like, they have a pretty good track record. Yeah. Fantastic, fantastic approach. Of course, when you, when you I mean, we, most of people, well, I'm, I'm now with the auto group for four years. What, I, I knew that, that part of auto was Bon Prix, but actually I didn't know that Manufaktum, Sportcheck, MyToys, Limango, Bauer, Schwab, Heine, actually there are tons of retail companies who are now part for, of the auto group. And uh, what, what really worked well are three businesses. First of all, it's, uh, it's furniture. We are the biggest seller, digit, we are the biggest digital seller of furniture, which is not so easy. We are the biggest digital seller, uh, seller of white goods, dishwasher, washing machine, and of course, we are, we are very proud of our growth in the fashion business. And uh, I think in these three areas, we, feel, we, feel, we still feel pretty comfortable, but to be honest, it's not easy. Mm -hmm. uh, we had lots, of, I was really inspired by the talks of uh, Klaus Hommels, by Stefan Winners, uh, who, who described how tough it is for a German B2C player a play in this global area. And from the, from the remaining companies, you know, my first job was uh, with Fireball. I did search engine marketing, comparing to what's going on with the other digital companies. I think the, the Otto Group is, uh, in these days, the leading uh, number two in Europe uh, and, and the biggest German uh, digital B2C mm -hmm. business we are running here. Uh, so, Jen, I want to talk about the retail apocalypse. I mean, it seems every week we hear about store closures in, in the US. Every retailer, it seems like, almost all retailers, are shrinking their footprints. What is the future of physical retail? Yeah, for me, there's, there's space there and there's people there. And I think what the physical store can do is two key things. One is bring the brand story to life. So we're seeing a trend of kind of Apple looking at creating town halls and communities around that environment. So they're teaching people how to photo skills and they're teaching people lessons and they don't care if that customer is an Apple customer or a Samsung customer. They care about creating that network of people that can connect and that community hub and vibe is coming back. So that brand experience and that, uh, that entertainment almost of creating that experience within is, is one. The second area which I see is really important is the support that goes with retail. So if you're buying something online, it's very difficult sometimes to send it back, to talk to someone about it's not right. But we're seeing more and more partnership opportunities where actually the physical store can be a place where people can go in and, and get that after sales service to help them out. We last year did a accelerator program with Westfield Labs and what came out of that and a lot of our projects or our, our startups we worked with were actually around creating a, a service experience and using that space. So Happy Returns is one of those where 
in a mall, there can be a space where if you buy anything online, you can easily take it back. It's easy. But what the benefit of that is to the mall and the retail environment is all some people now have a bit of cash back in their pockets. They go and spend it in that space. So just thinking about that su support aspect, having that one-on-one -on -one conversation, and even looking at how people in that environment can be augmented differently. So another example is Hero um, in the UK. So they have a service where people who can shop online can actually chat to someone in store who might not be busy or might not be with a customer. So they're more efficiently using their time with staff that might not be doing anything or more available to create a support network that goes along with it. And, and for me, I see that's the mm -hmm. shift. It's, it's making it more of a service and support experience. Right. But that sounds like there's purchase. a lot less. There's a lot less physical retail. There, we do not need all these ban bank branches. Yeah, I think uh, I mean, I think the Urine talked are... about functional yeah. shopping. Yeah. Agree, yeah. and I think the malls will, will potentially yeah, I, go I, away. I, I think for the, for the, for the traditional uh, retailers offline, it will be a very tough piece. Because look what's going on. I, I just talked about our particip participate strategy. When you look to the big retailers, uh, some of them, they need earn money in their core business. So if you, if you have significant revenue streams from, from media, if you have significant revenue streams from logistic, financing, and especially from cloud computing, uh, for, for a retailer who has no, no, no opportunity to get money from these revenue streams, I think it's a tough business. And on the other hand side, when you run a traditional retail business, you've got costs. Uh, uh, you've got headcounts, you need storage, and on the other hand, uh, in the internet, you have to compete with totally different prices. And the consumer comes to you, he wants to have a huge variety of product. So my belief is, is uh, that the traditional, traditional retailers will decline for at least 20, 30% within the next five years. With the traditional, like the, the number, the footprint? The offline retailers, yeah. Yeah. Definitely. But I, think, but I think there are some examples of, of uh, companies who are quite successful still in retail. Sure. Sure. Um, I was talking to um, a UK-based consumer electronics uh, shop, and he was outperforming uh, Amazon on a lot of levels. And the reason, what, the way they do it is they have the personal relationship. So people come to them talking about, I want uh, this uh, TV set or something, and now they're going in an up, uh, trading up position. Okay, take a look at this 4K TV. Um, do you want the sound bar and stuff like this? I think this is what traditional retail is all about. It's the, it's a, like the personal um, communication between a salesperson and a customer. And um, I mean, if you look around over here in Germany, I mean, Kudam, there's not like uh, empty spaces in, uh, in the retail industry. I think in Germany, uh, traditional retail is losing one to 2% of revenue every year. This is significant um, because, I mean, uh, it will get more. But there, I think uh, with clever concepts, um, you will, able to, will be able to survive. I don't believe that there will be no shops in, uh, in, in, mm -hmm. in, in, in the future. I, will be, I believe that there are different shops, like pop-up shops, like uh, showroom shops where you can experience goods and, and stuff. And, and these kind of, of uh, um, developments will kick in uh, in the next years, I think. So talk, though, about the functional retail that's mm -hmm. going to go away. I mean, because I understand what you're saying on, on the experiential side. But also, I mean, we're seeing unmanned stores in China take off. And Amazon is, 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 is experimenting here, too. I think that there's a lot going on in this functional area. There is this uh, um, an example, for, for instance, in, in the Netherlands. It's called Picnic. It's a startup. It's, it's really crazy because they um, transport the supermarket to your home. So um, you uh, sign up in a mobile application, and every day at the same time, um, a, a milkman-like car comes up to you and gives you give you your goods. I think we're living in a consumer-centric uh, area right now. Um, you can't expect people to come to you to buy stuff. You have to, you know, uh, bring uh, your services to them, actually. And this is what we see in, in, in China also. Um, both Alibaba and WeChat um, uh, playing around with unmanned uh, mobile supermarkets. Uh, some of them are, uh, you know, they, they, they're driving through the city of, of Shanghai. You order the supermarket via a mobile application. It looks like a, a science fiction movie, but this is something that will happen, I think. Mm -hmm. These kind of technologies will really um, 
uh, create disruption in this area of functional yeah. shopping. What, what is the societal impact of this, though? Because in the U.S., 10% of employment is in retail. And when the manufacturing jobs went away, people were told to go into services, and retail is typically one of the sort of stepping stones mm -hmm. in, in, a, in services for jobs. Um, so when those things are all wiped away, not all, but a lot of them are, uh, I mean, what... What are we going to do? Because we're seeing growth in warehouses and things like that. But robots are going to be doing that. I mean, Amazon is quickly you know, developing robots to, to do the warehouse work. I, I'm not too sure about this. When we talk about this uh, situation, this startup picnic in the Netherlands is quite successful. So there are drivers. Uh, they have people who are picking the goods. I think Amazon is uh, using some robots in warehouses. But um, uh, I think most of the uh, goods that are delivered by Amazon Prime now are picked by men because um, they know I never see something like uh, uh, um, that is not in a perfect shape uh, when I order this. And I think there will be no new jobs. I understand. Every revolution, people are saying something like this. Um, but I think there will be new areas of, of, of service, of delivery, um, of communication. Um, these people will have the chance to um, expand and grow into this. I mean, I just yesterday read the article that in the US, at this Christmas business, first, first time there will be more sales online than, than offline for the first time. Mm -hmm. I think this is a dramatic change, which is no surprise for everybody. But on the other hand, we have to be aware that I read another article that for each person Amazon hires, uh, four are fired elsewhere. I mean, this, this is a trend of e-commerce, uh, which is, I don't know if it's, if it's stoppable. I think we have to think about it. Right. Um, so, Jen, I mean, you talked a lot about like creating experiences in these. Uh, can you explain how to connect that online experience with the offline experience? Because they've always... They've been very separate. You yeah. Know? I think it goes back to what I was saying before. I think there's, there's a few ways, and service and support is one of those key aspects. So we're seeing a lot more a movement into conversational commerce. And actually, a lot of people on their mobile phones, to be able to chat with someone, to order, to book, to, to pay, that's something where actually you, know, you walk into a store and you can just start to look at and explore of, of what that is. <coughs> I think there's also a, a level of how we start to use technology um, in store environments that will help make that shift a little bit different as well. So if we're looking at creating experiences where you know, augmented reality can actually help you understand what you might be buying, the story behind it, the history behind it, and just thinking of smarter ways that we can use that technology to, to bridge that, that gap together. But I think when we start to look at like, the likes of Amazon, what they've done really well is to be able to connect everything digitally in the, in the main instance, but to start to create stores now where you can go and express and, and find products. All your data in there is, is known. You're able to purchase things and, and walk out. <laughs> so for me, it's looking at experiences that will make people understand a brand a little bit more, um, and actually to be able to continue that experience, because the user journey isn't an, a, it's not linear. We all know that. There's going to be shopping, there's browsing, there's purchase. And mm -hmm. the fact that that's shifting into um, one experience, that's how we can start to look at bringing that, bridging that gap of what physical and, and mm -hmm. digital means. Like, What's a good use and a bad use of personalization? Because personalization gets talked about a lot. Um, but I'm not sure if everyone really wants a personalized experience every time that they go shopping. Not every time, no. And I think there's. We created an experience for Nike, which was all about understanding. But it's basically to help them get better and help them get fitter. So it was called Nike On Demand. And what that helped do was create a service to understand people's running and fitness potential, and then help curate that based on the data we knew about them to give them services and, and benefits um, in their day-to-day -day life. So looking at ways that we can Create something personalized about the, the value exchange and the data that you get back from it, but what that service is. I think a non-personalized experience is you might, if we're moving into the world of pricing changing depending on who you are and, and what you're doing, you might not want to be recognized when you walk into a store because yeah. suddenly something might be more expensive because I'm this person versus something else. So I think there's levels of that that become a bad experience where now it becomes a pricing model versus an actual 
I feel like I'm getting value out of what that conversation could be and, and what personalization brings to that experience yeah. as well. So Torsten, we see dynamic pricing in, in some areas, but not in other areas. A lot of retail is still not doing dynamic pricing. What, what's the future there? Yeah, I'm, I, I want to talk about, but, but before talking about dynamic pricing, I'm happy to, to add uh, my view on personalization. Okay. I think this is such a key for, for, for advertising in the future. You know, when I started my, 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 my job with Axel Springer, we had one, one ad and showed, showed this ad to everybody in print. But I think in digital, it's a huge challenge and, and, and opportunity for, for advertisers to bring their data together with the publisher's data. I mean, uh, if you want to run, run ads and you, you show the same ad to everybody, this mass communication, I think this is more or less over. And using your data as an advertiser and bring this together with publisher's data and run campaigns on a totally different level, I think this is a huge challenge uh, to make advertising more successful and make advertising better. Mm -hmm. And I see huge opportunities for creative agencies as well. So, you know, uh, we are a huge advertiser as well, and quite often when we run campaigns, we see that we want to address different target groups. But on the, end, on the other hand side, quite often it's a, it's a tough discussion with the creative agency to convince them to create uh, for ads for different target groups. So quite often you, you run the same ad for students, then you run, run for a mother, and there are lots of opportunities to make advertising better. Mm -hmm. But on, on that, just to stay on that before we get to the dynamic pricing, there's always this assumption that more targeting is better. Um, but it's an assumption usually on the side of advertisers and media, not on the side of, of people. Like, I'm not sure if there's evidence that people really want their advertising to be more targeted. I think, I think it's a question, especially when you, you, when, when you compare Germany with the US. I think the Germans, they don't like stalking. But for example, I saw a fantastic campaign. We love of, it. Uh, I know, I know. <laughs> uh, uh, I saw a fantastic campaign for the new mini countryman uh, coming out. They had, they had a, a general image campaign, then they had a campaign for a female student, then they have a, a campaign for a mother, they had a campaign for, for, for a, a woman uh, living in the city, being 40 plus. So, so they really did f f four, four different movies. And I think in this way it's okay, especially when you, when you are able to run campaigns with a, with a, with a significant mass and, and a high quality of targeting which is totally different than you, you look for a Dyson uh, on an auto DE and then you see a Dyson for, uh, for, for the next four weeks. I think this is, at least for Germany, people don't like this. But the other thing, you, it's easier to buy, to sell your product, and on the other hand side, you can probably sell it with the right features, which makes your margin much more higher. Mm -hmm. So let, let's, let's talk a little bit about dynamic pricing. I mean, Amazon bought Whole Foods, now it's using data in order to change the price of avocados. Uh, how, how far along are we in dynamic pricing and, and where does that go? In Germany, uh, we, of course, we do dynamic pricing. I remember when the gas station started to, to do dynamic pricing, when they changed their pricing uh, from mornings to evenings, from, from, from weekends to, to, to working days. Everybody went more or less crazy, but now it's pretty normal. What we do in the auto group, uh, we run dynamic pricing, depends on the demand, depends on daytime. Uh, what we don't do is we don't show a different price to an Android user than we show it to, to an Apple user. So uh, the, the, we change prices from daytime and other reasons, but we don't place at the same time different prices to different users. Okay. And of course, if, well, this, is it just because that makes the math? It's, it's in Germany, it's a, it's a legal discussion, actually, like, mm -hmm. like lots of things uh, which are connected to digital. <laughs> uh, so so uh, we are not sure if this is uh, from the German legal, from the law, German law covered. But of course, when you do a dynamic pricing, as I describe it, you can increase your margin uh, significantly. Yeah. Jörn? Um, I, I think dynamic pricing is one thing, but let me come back to this personalization thing because, I mean, um, 
it always sounds like there are hundreds and hundreds of uh, uh, services and advertisings that are created for me, actually. But my personal, uh, my personal experience is not showing this. So if I look at my inbox that I have for newsletters or shops or something, I, I really, I'm really looking for something like this. I would look for a price that is made for me. I would look for, like, for a service that is made for me. But the reality is it's about retargeting and it's about spamming. And this mm -hmm. is, I mean, this is Amazon, for instance, sitting on a massive pile of data. But what is the most intelligent thing they get out? It's like uh, um, people who bought this product will buy this uh, next. So this is, not, this is not AI. This is not machine learning. This is not like intelligent. This is uh, simple statistics. And even Facebook, if you look at your Facebook wall, I mean, a lot of things uh, is, is retargeting from, from Google mm -hmm. advertising or something. I never see something where I say, great, you know, great. This is my individual price. This is my individual campaign. This is really made for me. Right. That's, I think when people talk about personalization in, in advertising, they're really talking about retargeting often enough. Yeah. And this is boring. I think this is, I don't want to see the, if this is the whole magic, of, of uh, what advertising can do today. I mean, it's kind of, um, I don't know. I, I would rather like some personalized thing because people really like personalized services. If I go in a restaurant and someone is greeting me, I mean, it's not digital, but people like the, the, the general terms like this approach. And um, I would like to see this in an in a, in a, uh, online world or in a classic traditional retail world, but so far, Digital services are not providing that much of, of, of personalized mm -hmm. services. And uh, dynamic pricing, is, a, I would say, is okay. It's, it's nice for uh, a brick-and-mortar retailer, for instance, to set up the prices accordingly how Amazon is doing this. Um, do they want to uh, play out individual prices for individuals? I don't, I don't know. In, in Germany, this would cause a lot of trouble um, and a lot of talk about equality and stuff like this. So I. I I, I don't see the value into this. So mm -hmm. uh, I see the value to adjust the prices on a digital, uh, digital signage uh, um, like Amazon is doing this, constantly adjusting the prices. Mm -hmm. This is what uh, consumer electronics uh, are actually doing. So on payments in five years, are the majority of countries cashless? I, I, I hope so, but... Um, <laughs> But, 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 I mean, payment is just a cultural habit. I mean, uh, in, in, in Germany, 57% of all payments are cash. Um, same goes for tech uh, countries like Singapore. In Singapore, 60% of all transactions are cash. I don't know exactly the numbers in, in the US, but I saw some, some uh, dollars still there. Um, I think a lot of things have to come together. Um, uh, to convince people to go to mobile payment. A brilliant example is like uh, in the UK, Transport for London. Um, if you can do trans contactless transaction on the travel and transport system, that is really, in, in London I feel that I'm in a, in a, in a really mobile payment uh, mm -hmm. connected world actually. Um, for other countries it will um, maybe last a bit longer because it's, it's a it's a very strong cultural habit to pay cash, to use a certain debit card or something like this. But I mean, in the future, really, I, I, I think that everything will go digital. Uh, but it will take much more time than uh, people thought initially. Mm -hmm. So I mean, the, the, the facial recognition, is this more like a stunt? Is this going to be like a true way that people are going to be paying? Yeah, I, I think when you look at facial recognition, I mean, uh, to up tomorrow we can um, order the uh, iPhone 10, and um, I've seen a, a keynote recently of the Apple ex uh, managers of this. I mean, this is about paying with your with your face. It's not, it is you pay iTunes goods or uh, applications uh, with your biometric pattern of uh, facial recognition. This will take this to, um, I mean. This will take this to uh, um, a wide audience, really. This would open up the market for facial recognition. Um, but the facial recognition has to be, uh, um, there has to be a clear use case for this. Because I mean, you remember this, the AI supermarket, I think, uh, they had a, a, a shitstorm recently where, they, um, um, where people discovered that they had facial recognition cameras uh, in their store. In Germany, people going nuts about this because, I mean, this is, uh, 
they don't see, but the reason for this is because don't, they don't see the use case for this. If I, mm -hmm. if, I, if I have a service that is based on facial recognition, I will use it if it's faster, if it's more convenient, if it's giving me whatever. And uh, I, I think this will, I think facial recognition with the iPhone 10 will uh, um, go into uh, a wide audience and will be widely accepted. And okay. this is a big chance uh, for this kind of technology. So, Jim, what is it? Give me, give me one uh, retail technology that's overrated. Um, we were talking before. I think what's overrated is how people, how we monitor people in stores. So we were talking about beacons and, mm. and what that means for. Everyone was talking about beacons and understanding where people go and, and what they do. And the problem with that is you require an app. You require a lot of infrastructure that the consumer needs to to um, be involved in. So I feel that technology needs to become much more seamless and integrated. Um, we're seeing different tracking tools at the moment where we can measure um, people walking in just based on their shoes and information. So it's more around the macro trends of understanding who people are in that environment um, to do that and then have that frictionless technology that goes with it. And I think right now we, we're putting technology in everything and it's starting to become a barrier between the actual consumer one-on-one -on -one human experience we were talking about versus I need to get my phone out, mm -hmm. I, need to, I need to connect with something, I'm getting a message because I'm walking past. I think that whole notification, pushing content to me, where, where am I in that environment is something that we, we need to kind of cut through and, and it's more about that. I just want to walk in, I just want to Amazon go, pick up my products, walk out, Technology is just interacting and, and it's in yeah. the background. I'm, I'm not even thinking about what it is. So what's on the other side? What's, what's one that you think is underrated, <coughs> underutilized? I think it is interesting seeing the push in how we start to take a, um, AR or augmented reality into mm. our, our products and services. So the technology hasn't been there yet, but now we're seeing Google and, and Facebook releasing kits that are easy to access. And that ability to, for brands to actually create better experiences, like you look at what IKEA is doing in regards to how you can start to shape your home, you can curate that experience. I can see a lot more of that happening in, in the retail environment where it's connecting a lot more of the digital experience with the physical. You might still walk into a store and, and that AR experience is augmented, but I can see a lot more of that happening in regards to consumers mm -hmm. just really understanding what they're buying and, and getting a feel for what it is. Okay, Torsten, how about you? One, one overrated and one underrated. I would say uh, I believe in personalization and individualization. I think this is a huge topic which will come. Uh, and to, to, to bring these things together, uh, I think in, especially here in Germany what we see is that, they are, that the US, the three US companies are growing. And I think to, to be able to have these tons of data to make good personalization uh, and individualization, German, com German companies have to come closer together. They have to cooperate to have significant data to do this. I mean, we've got a cooperation with Struer, and I think more has to come for the Germans to be able to survive against uh, the, the leading US players, because otherwise we are too small here in the market, uh, especially after what we've seen here in the morning. I 100% agree in this. And um, I absolutely believe in this trend. And what is over, overrated, uh, I, I think the, the topic that Facebook might go to retail business could be an overrated mm. trend. There are lots of rumors that they want to do it. I think this won't happen. Yeah, probably too. The margins aren't there for Facebook. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I think yeah. overrated is uh, clearly beacons, and, and but this was overhyped. You know, the hype yeah. was was uh, uh, tremendous, and with that, audio waves, Wi-Fi tracking, all these spoofing technologies. I think this is, people don't like this, and it leads to something that is called physical retargeting. So, if you don't like retargeting in the online world, I mean, imagine something in a physical store. It's I, I think it could be kind of annoying. Um, I think underappreciated is a bit mobile technology because I mean a lot of retailers, traditional retailers, 
uh, thinking about you know, uh, mobile applications on, on customers' phones, but uh, they should think also how they could uh, uh, benefit from mobile technologies uh, in their stores. So equip sales associates with, uh, uh, with iPads, with I iPhones, to, to you know, have the same level of information and data that the people that are coming in the store. And I, yesterday I was talking to a guy of uh, Marks and Spencer in the UK, and they are using iPads uh, in fitting rooms. So you change, you know, and then you need a, another size, and you, you just simply tap it on the, on, 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 on the iPad. This is so obviously a, a good idea, um, but this is coming very late, I would say, because everybody is saying like, something like uh, mobile, is not, uh, mo mobile is there. But I think um, when you talk about um, not the customer side, but the retailer side, there are a lot of opportunities uh, based on mobile technology. Okay. Jaren, Torsten, Jan, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.